Good morning, everybody. This is Ben, and I am joined once again by Adam. Good morning, Ben. We are here for uh, the last episode of the podcast for Ruiz's The Four Agreements. This is part of the Black Wolf Book Club and the first book, just in case you're hopping on at the end of this thing. We kicked off the book club. Um, has it been four weeks yeah, just beginning about of September, beginning right? of September, right after Labor Day is when we started. There you go. That's right. Tuesday after Labor Day. Um, so exactly four weeks, and uh, we've made our way through. Today, we will be discussing Chapter 6 and Chapter 7, as well as a, a summary overall of you know how Adam feels this book went, how the book club went. Um, but first, a few announcements. Okay, So as we said, we're concluding the book, and at the end of each book, we wanted to bring people together. Um, uh, to sit down and discuss their thoughts on what we've just read. And so this Sunday, September 30th, uh, discussion beginning at 1230. The doors will be open uh, for open gyms. So the doors will be open before. Show up at 12 if you'd like. I bring food. It will be a potluck situation. So bring a dish or bring a beverage. Um, yes, people are nutrition challenged, but don't stress too much about that. Like if you walk in with fried chicken, maybe, maybe that's a little too far, but, um, it doesn't have to be a veggie plate either. We can just bring food. Okay. Whatever you like to eat. Bring, uh, yeah, like good whole foods that you like to eat. We'll yeah. sit around, like have a good time and yeah. We're going to have a table. We're going to have tables out, uh, try to set up kind of a round table discussion, give anybody a chance to speak on things. Obviously, um, Adam will be able to lead the conversation, but if you have something that you that's been eaten at you, or or you wish you had your own podcast to discuss, then you obviously can bring that point up, and we would love uh, to kind of bat it around with you and with everybody else that took part in reading this. So that is this Sunday, twelve thirty to two. Um, again, that's going to be a hard stop. We we want to be respectful of your time and and keeping you here all the way through a Sunday afternoon is not going to be the goal. That leads us to October second, so Tuesday. After this Sunday, we'll be kicking off the next book. Um, so it'll be Better Than Before by Gretchen Rubin. Uh, this is a longer text. And how long? What's the timeline on this one? So, so for those that don't know, The Four Agreements was done in four weeks. Um, and really, as we were just discussing before we started recording, many of you read it in like a day. And so uh, this Better Than Before is going to be a little bit different. It's going to require more time. Yeah, the, the timeline is going to stay roughly the same in terms of about a month to uh, to read it. The, the book is broken up into sections that fit nicely in terms of a timeline or reading um, a section a, a, a week. You know, with the four agreements, we, you know, we bundled a couple chapters together at, at different points and things like that. Better Than Before breaks down a little bit more nicely into sections, so it's going to be about one section a week um, for four weeks once we kick it off on October 2nd. Awesome. So Better Than Before starting October 2nd. Uh, I will be, and that's the last announcement, I will be sending out a book club survey. Okay, so just a few questions on uh, what, one, did you actually read the book? You know, What were your thoughts on it? What did you use? Did you utilize this podcast? Uh, did you find value in it? And then the, the last question will be kind of a free response. You know, what did you truly enjoy and what might you uh, have wanted to see more of or maybe you have an idea of something we didn't try at all that we could try? So uh, we cannot continue to grow this or make it what it can be without you. So feedback is a must. So you'll be receiving that when I post this podcast. So if you're listening to this, then it is already in your email. Okay, so please, and don't hold back. They're anonymous. It's going to be through SurveyMonkey. I am not smart enough to track your IP address. So just give me the truth. Yeah, we just want feedback. Um, as with all of this stuff and things that we're practicing, like it is non-judgmental. Like, um, you know, we want to get better. We want to improve. Like that's what this book club and podcast is, de is dedicated to is self-improvement. And if we weren't practicing that ourselves, then we would certainly be hypocrites. Um, so, yeah, it's it's all taken in the spirit of improving. We want you guys to have a great experience. That's another reason why we're doing this. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody has a great experience overall. So feel free to share um, any thoughts. And you guys have been awesome about approaching us individually um, in the gym about any thoughts or things that you like or don't like um, about the book club as it started to evolve here. Absolutely. Okay. So like I said, today we'll be discussing chapter six and chapter seven and then kind of the book overall. So um, 
looking back, you know, chapter one opened up. It kind of explained the players that Ruiz was going to use, the the voices we'd hear. He framed the dream. Um, he kind of framed everything that we're dealing with. And then uh, chapters two, three, four, and five were each dedicated to one of the four agreements. Uh, we unpacked those or our, our takeaways from those in the last episode um, on the podcast. So go back and check that out if you have not already. And so then chapter six, and you and I were just discussing this. Um, chapter six is where the work is done. It, it's something, and I, and I just told you that your study guide, I think the chapter itself, what Ruiz wrote, and then this study guide that you posted, I think that if somehow someone, and hey, we're busy people, it would not be the craziest thing for someone to say, hey, Adam, I don't have time to read. You want me to read a whole hundred pages? That's crazy. If they came up to me and said that, and I was not taking it personal, I was learning my lesson and not being emotional in my response and calling them stupid because that would be rude, um, I would say go read chapter six and then check this study guide out. And again, even if they didn't want to read, I'd say read the study guide and really analyze these questions because I think what you did here, um, it's something that one, as Ruiz really discusses, isn't common practice. And I think two, it is... It's literally, there's, the question we're going to ask today is an actionable step. Like, what is an actionable step? But it's literally action. It's, it's finally putting into action what's discussed. And even if you don't read the discussion, it's, it's taking steps to get clarity on life, which I think everyone agrees life is a mess. I think everyone, it's that old thing. I, I said it again. I t someone brought it up yesterday. Like, when you're in third grade, you look at your third grade teacher, and you're like, that is an adult. And now I know third grade teachers. I'm like, they're drinking on Tuesday. Like, not all of you, you're amazing. And even if you are, maybe you're celebrating. But my point is like, we're all a mess. Like, adulthood is like running through life set on fire. So like, uh, actionable steps to find clarity to maybe put that fire out. So, um, I mean, with that, like, what, what are your thoughts on that? The, the, that this is the chapter where, where Ruiz takes everything he's discussed and he kind of gives you opportunity to actually take steps so even if you're not well thought out you're not like philosophical and like like to interpret things this is where we like all right here we go yeah like you said this is the chapter where the work gets done so in any personal development work or anything that we're looking to change um there's a, there are multiple steps that we have to go through we have to assess where we are right now and define those terms we have to um you know we have to look at where we want to be and like we're like we're grounded a lot in theory and possibility um, and we're grounded a lot in, you know, different philosophies. And we go, we went through that a lot with Ruiz here. We went through the four agreements and looked at um, these different ways that we could be or different ways uh, that we could interpret things. Uh, but there comes a time in any personal development work where we're holding like these contrary beliefs, like who we are now versus who we wish we could be, um, things that go against how we're currently being. And there comes a time where you either have to act on it and take actionable steps to change or you don't or, you know, or, or, you know, or you don't act uh, on those things. And chapter six is where, um, is where that work takes place. Like serious reflection does count as work, right? You know, seriously assessing where you are um, and, and what you're doing, like that that does count of that does count as work. And the first action item is always like acknowledging where deficiencies exist and where you want to improve. But in order to move past that, there needs to be concrete steps that you take in order to, to take those steps. And here in chapter six is where Ruiz starts identifying what some of those concre concrete steps are, or at least provides you with the questions to maybe empower you a little bit more to take those concrete actions. Now, again, do you think it's, I think we, we can sometimes operate, I don't know if you want to say operate in a vacuum, especially in something like this. We're in a book club right now. Like people signed up to read this. And so, um, kind of that personal growth, you would assume they have that mindset that they are looking for this opportunity. Um, but something that's, that jumped out to me in chapter six is, um, like it just made me, cause I've always wanted to be aware. Like if you can show me where I'm wrong, I want to know. And, and I don't mean that. Like I had, I've had a lot of people that I've interacted with in life professionally to like, give me feedback, give me feedback and they get it and they don't, then nothing changes. So like, but for me, like the journey of sobriety and all these things, I think I, that was my biggest transition going from being blissfully ignorant, even though I was a mess 
But like, if you don't, if you're not aware you have a problem, then do you have a problem? Even though like the world's burning down, but if you're not aware of it, then like, eh, this is just my life now. Yeah. It's such a loaded thing, but like, what? I, I don't know if it's how do you become aware? How? What is what does true awareness mean? Is it? It's not judgment. Like, man, I really do screw things up. Like, I think that is such a loaded thing, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on. Is it enough for an athlete, or I'm sorry, people, because it could be non-athletes listening. Is it enough for them to know that there's probably something? Because, like, he talks about it a lot. The first step is to become aware, aware of what you're confronting. Um, How hard do you think that is for people to admit to or even truly become aware of? It, it, it's very difficult. Um, and, and you talked about that. Hopefully people should be reading this with the frame of mind, it, you know, to want to take steps to improve. Um, you know, you know, Ben, you know, Ben, and some of uh, our listeners know that I do personal development, you know, holistic personal development coaching and leadership development coaching um, through my own practice as well. And one of the first things I do before I take on a client is make sure that they are like fully committed to to the work that we're about to, that we're about to do, um, you know, without that really, without that, um, commitment to wanting to change, like it's really, it's going to be very hard to change. And that's always going to come from the client, from the other individual to create meaningful and sustainable change. It has to come from within, um, how difficult is it to be aware? Like it's very difficult. Like I operated throughout much of my life, like not thinking that I had a problem. And I think like that's what's so powerful about the book is that you look at chapters like don't take things personally. um, And all of a sudden you become aware of all these ways in which you do take things personally. So the first step to become aware and to to becoming aware is sometimes people pointing it out to you. Um, At the same time, you might not be in a place or a frame of mind where you're like where you're able to see it. Um, you have to be able to widen your perspective and look at things with an open perspective in order to see that there are other possibilities out there for how you're currently acting or how you're currently behaving. Um, and if you don't have that wider lens or that wider perspective, then it's like really tough to become aware. How I think um, that awareness becomes facilitated is like there are um, – I think like there's multiple ways in which you see that you're not operating at your full capacity. Maybe there are a couple of consistent setbacks in your life. And, you know, you say like, there's no way it has to be like this. Uh, You know, I think like that's one of the most powerful instigators for personal change is that there are like a couple of setbacks or you see how you could be better. Um, from there, maybe your field, of, maybe your your field of vision, your lens begins to widen, and you at least begin to consider that there might be other ways of doing things than how you're doing them currently. But if there's not that consideration that there might that you might be able to do something different, yeah, then obviously it's going to be very tough to then change or acknowledge any type of behavior. I think that I'm one, I consider myself extremely lucky that I I have made some horrendous life choices i mean it wound up in jail and lost out on a career and all these different things and so for me my when i started going to aa you know everybody says people don't change because on average people don't change on average they don't investigate themselves here they don't become aware of things and if they do become aware they don't try to take those make those changes rock bottom is certainly a way because when you're down there you have no choice yep you know i tell the team here Specifically, Joe Wells heard it a million times. Every time we come across some sort of hardship, it's an opportunity for innovation. It's an opportunity for us to be better. And every time we've come across hardship, we have gotten better, not across the board, but at least in one area, we will improve because we have to. Because whether we have to go lean or whether it's we run out of money or whatever it is, we always have to iterate. So, like, hardship brings awareness, and then you're able to better execute on it. But for me, like, rock bottom was, like, once I realized that, one, I had to change – and two, change is possible. And I think that's what this book does for people is it shows you change is possible. But now I want to empath- be very, very empathetic to those of, like people that, that thank- thankfully did not make the mistakes I made, that didn't hit a rock – like I hit a real rock bottom. Um, but, but then again for them, maybe the rock bottom is more like missing out on that job, like not having it taken away, but like they weren't hired for the job because they didn't have something or they weren't – uh, situated properly they hadn't made this or maybe the family life isn't as good and they're aw- like becoming more aware of that so all, so all the situations you're describing whether it's rock bottom or someone didn't get a job i think you're describing a situation in which someone created space for reflection 
And the, uh, the issue with most of our lives is that we don't create space for reflection. It's just one thing to the next that you wake up, you, you go to, you're racing out the door and you're going to work and you go work out and you're exhausted and you go home and you, you're dealing with your kids or like, there's no space to, to think about anything. And so when you're at a point in rock bottom, like you actually take time to think about something when you don't get a job, you take the time and, and you think about something. Um, and unless we create space and time for reflection in our lives, like there's no, there's no time to really to think about those things and how things could be different. Does it have to be this way? And so all the situations that you just described, I think the common thread it, there is that there's someone created the space and time for reflection. So that brings me to, I think, uh, some that jumped out to me, um, you know, so I think it was throw and I'm paraphrasing, but I went to the woods to front the true facts of life. Jesus wandered the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, Ruiz says specifically, um, talks about the desert specifically. It's where we get to face our demons. And so to me, that desert is reflection. It's the opportunity. Yeah, um, I mean, and I don't think it's a coincidence that I started with kind of my personal development work, like in Ithaca, like in the woods as well. Like I went out for a hike like every weekend. And like that's been something that's been difficult for me here in Houston is like uh, I've been working on a bunch of things. I'm here at the gym. I'm building my personal coaching business. Like there's some other projects I'm pursuing. And uh, it was real easy to do that in Ithaca and just get out on a hike on a weekend for an hour or two. And it's like more difficult here in Houston, even though I live like right across the street from the bayou now. And so like, that's been a struggle, something that I've been trying to implement more in my life is like, I, I got to get back to that. And I started looking up and planning hiking trips in Texas. I know you got to drive a little bit more to get to them. I've been trying to get on the bayou more. If anybody wants to go hike with me or walk the bayou, like, let me know. We'll, we'll make it happen. But, yeah, like, I don't think it's a coincidence that this type of work that especially started with me, like, in nature. Um, like, nature is very, very powerful for, like, giving you space and time to reflect. Turn off your phone. Put it away. Go out for a hike. Go out for a walk. And just be with your thoughts for an hour to two hours. And you don't even have to, when you're walking around, you need to have to be consciously thinking. Just go and be present where you are. So, I mean, absolutely. And and we're going to talk about actual steps here in a second because I think that's that's really important. I think people don't know. I think a lot of people aren't aware. But so, okay, it, let's be very literal here. So we don't have wilderness here, okay? And also, I don't think that necessarily he's framing, like, because he talks about the desert. And, like, in the Bible, when Jesus goes in the desert, it wasn't a good thing. He wasn't like, I'm going to hike the woods. Yeah. It was like he went to fast. He didn't eat. Um, he was he was there to confront Satan. I mean, he was there to confront the, the great evil. Um, the transcendentalists, which, of course, are from the great northeast. Um, and so they, they were speaking of literally getting to the woods because it quieted their mind and they were able to separate themselves from the bullshit and, and see what truly mattered. But if we're talking about the desert mentality, which which I think is really, really important – how do you how, what in your opinion how can someone put themselves in that situation and seeing it as a good thing okay so not not depriving for no reason but maybe what are things that we should and you said turn your phone off what are things that we should maybe do without in order to set ourselves up for better reflection because we i've been reading more about meditation how to get into it and they're like well here's the first here's the first thing First few times you do it, even if you go somewhere, you're not going to meditate. Like you're going to be there and your brain's going to be on fire and you're just going to talk and talk in your mind, talk in your mind, talk in your mind. But it takes time to learn how to, to kind of zen out. So how – let's not try to be perfect. In your opinion, what are ways that I could set myself up for kind of a wilderness experience, a, a desert experience where I, I turn the noise off to really put myself in a great situation to reflect if it's not something I'm, I'm accustomed to doing? Yeah, there, there are a number of ways that you can do it. And, you know, you talked about that, the meditation that the first time, a couple of times you do it, your thoughts are bouncing around. Like if your thoughts are bouncing around or if your thoughts are quiet, that's still meditation. Meditation is just the act of um, trying to quiet your thoughts down, of letting things pass and acknowledging them, acknowledging them non-judgmentally. Just because your thoughts stray, like doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're not meditating. It means that you are um, and as you practice and continue to get better at meditating, that I don't want to say better, but as you practice meditation, maybe your mind is a little bit more quiet or you can let go 
of those uh, those thoughts a little bit easier than you would uh, than you maybe were previously. There are a number of things that we can do to create more space in our lives. One, uh, hopefully, if you're listening to this podcast, you've done it. It's reading, like taking uh, a book and going and sit and reading somewhere. Five to ten minutes is creating space to be with your thoughts as long as you're not on your phone while you're reading. Um, another one is uh, a meditation practice, you know, five to ten minutes a day. Even sitting in, like, drinking a cup of coffee in the morning where, like, again, you're just by yourself, like, right? Like, it's creating space in your life where you're not looking to fill it with something else. Um, working out is a meditative form or is like a way to create space like in our lives as well so like, that's that's but that's exactly because i don't want to go into because we're going to talk in chapter seven about like that quiet coffee time and writing and, and and thinking about things the okay one of the common hardships is like a breakup i go through a breakup and mm-hmm. now I've, i don't know my value i don't know my worth because i had tied my worth to her and i'm speaking very personally because that's what i always do i always it's every relationship I've been in in the past has been like, if she's happy, I'm awesome. And if she's unhappy, I, I must be awful. So then the breakup happens. I think common practices will get back out there, like fill your mind with noise in that vein. So dating apps, go to as many, you know, go out to as many social events as possible. But what happens is I'm not going to learn anything from my previous experience. Yeah, fill in your mind with noise and distractions. Like, yeah, that might work for a little bit, but it's not going to create like deep, meaningful, sustainable change, which is what we're after. Like there's going to be a situation again where like you break up and then you're going to be right back where you started um, back to like meditation and a Buddhist aspect. Like life is suffering, right? Grasping is the cause of suffering. And uh, unless you take the time to actually uh acknowledge and reflect on things like the situations are going to change but they're like but they're still gonna but as long as you're holding on to that notion that my happiness is tied to someone else then like, there's going to be more opportunity for suffering um and so yeah distractions work great in the time like i've been through a breakup I, you know, i'm sure we all have like go get yourself like that pint of ben and jerry's or whatever it might be go get yourself like a donut and like just sit and acknowledge your feelings Like you have to allow yourself to feel. But if you don't acknowledge those feelings, if you don't sit with them, if you don't reflect, then those feelings are going to govern you without you knowing it. And that might be the worst that that might be one of the worst ways in which uh, in which we're not free. And chapter six talks about all these ways that we can create freedom. Like you have to acknowledge like the aspects that are governing your life. And if there are emotions that you haven't reckoned with, that you haven't acknowledged, that you haven't sat with and attempted to feel, then those emotions are going to govern what you do with like without you even knowing it. And that's like not a good place to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So this whole book has been about having the, the identifying agreements that we have consciously and subconsciously made. And these are basically like the societal norms that we've adopted as like, this is how I behave. This is not how I behave. Mm -hmm. Um, this is what I'm allowed to talk about in a group is not what I'm allowed to talk about, you know? And, and Ruiz pretty much goes into detail on how a lot of that is, is baseless or not baseless is based very on very real things, but it's unhealthy. Um, it's it having a, a tremendous negative impact and that uh, if we fall into the norms of society, society is not set up for our happiness. Society is not set up for us to live our dream. Um, society is actually set up to put us in hell because in chapter one, I believe he defines hell as where we currently are. Um, because it's an eternal burning. And when we are filled with these emotions that are left unchecked, that is burning. I mean, we've all felt that burning in our, that literal burning in our chest. And so um, the, the thing in chapter six and, and on your study guide, um, we have these beliefs of self. We have these things. And I took really personally the one he talks about. He talks about a young woman that's told as a child that she cannot sing, that her voice is ugly. She does not have a good singing voice. You know what she does? She quits singing. Because if she doesn't sing well, then why should she sing? Um, I think I've shared this before, but I went to private school here in Houston. And so we were fortunate to have uh, a lot of like arts programs. Like I was always in our art class every semester as well as a music class. And so uh, through like first through fourth grade, it was like vocal and then in fifth grade it was band but when i was in music classic singing i was told by miss von hedeman that i had a terrible voice and 
I was told that often. And even to the point that in fourth or fifth grade, whenever we did the Christmas play, I got to be Santa Claus. That actually was a really cool thing because you wanted to be Santa Claus. Like the mm-hmm. guys especially, like, you get to be Santa Claus. That's really cool. She took away my joy because she got to tack onto it. And she, she literally said this. Uh, you're going to be Santa Claus because Santa Claus doesn't sing. And so you know what I've never done since? I've never sang a day in my life. You know? It's terrible. It's like, that's so sorry to hear that. Very real. Like, and so him speaking, and it's, but it's, it's so powerful. She said it. It must be true. Never mind that my voice has changed. Who knows? I could have been trained. Like, never mind. There were so many options. Never mind that singing doesn't have a way it's supposed to sound. You know? Yeah. Like, that's the one thing. Church, like, no, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. One of the greatest things about, like, like, religious society that sings is, like, they're not, like, only sing this if you sing well. Yep. It's just, like, sing to the Lord. Like, just let it out. And so, not a music class. It was apparently, like, sing like you know how to. You know? We weren't trained. We are freaking kids. Mm-hmm. But it is to this day, obviously, as I'm starting to, like, get worked up, it still sticks with me. And so, I have a debilitating fear-based belief about singing. Like, if I would never sing in front of you. Like, that's just something that, like... I can't move past that. Yeah. And so that being kind of an extreme, um, what is like, what's an action that we can implement? Like what is the actual step on assuming we've identified a fear-based belief? What is an actual step on kind of getting rid of that fear-based belief? For sure. L- like you said, so the first action item is always to acknowledge what the fear or self-limiting belief is. And you said, assuming that, um, we've acknowledged it. Like you have to fully acknowledge it and reckon with it. The next one is like, you have to hold, like hold it in your hand. Like look at that self-limiting belief, like turn it around and like, look at all the different perspectives on it. Like, why do I feel this way? Like, how did it get to this point? Um, you have to actually like hold it in your hand. And then from there it's beginning to do things differently. So you've talked about singing the, the one that I'll talk about is, you know, like to be like, a to be like a high achiever, um, especially for me in, in college basketball in the past is like I had to be stressed and like on my phone all the time. Like that's how I had to do the job um, is that in order to be successful, like this is the way that the job must be done. So the first step is to say like, does the job have to be done this way? Like why? Like what are the what are the things that I do um, that cause stress? And then let's start to do things differently. So one was like uh, not one was sleeping very little. Like let's say it's you know, my routine would typically be like work until midnight and then like wake up at 5 a.m. So if, like that is not like that is not a healthy lifestyle. I don't advocate that for anybody. So the first thing that I did was I tried to get to bed before 11 a.m. Uh, or 11 p.m. Excuse me, 11 p.m. I tried to get to bed before 11 p.m. and that at least got me six hours of sleep. Uh, and, and then like and just trying to get you just start to move the needle a little bit more and a little bit more like you experiment you look at how you feel, you iterate, you experiment, and you do it again. And so I started feeling much better after I got six hours of sleep. So I said, oh, my God, what?" and uh, my, the quality of my work improved because I was feeling better. Um, and so I said, oh, my God, what if I was in bed by 10 p.m.? So I started doing that. Um, in, in terms of being on my phone, it's like, all right, um, uh, I don't want to be the person who's like, do I have to be on my phone all the time and be texting and calling recruits and AAU coaches and high school coaches and on Twitter trying to look for information? And so I said, let me go a day without checking tw- like high school basketball Twitter and seeing if like my life ends. And so it was, uh, you know, a day was challenging at first. Like at first it was like an hour. It was like, let me go an hour. Uh, and to see if like my life will end and like rec- if I'll lose out on all my recruits, like if I don't check Twitter for that hour. And so I went an hour and guess what? The, the world didn't end and we didn't lose out on a million recruits. And so then it was like getting, you know, trying to go like the morning without checking Twitter. Um, and then after that, you come to a certain point where you're like, OK, like maybe Twitter like is somewhat useful, but like my relationship with it has changed. Like it's uh, it's not a point where I'm checking it because I think I have to. It's like a point where I'm checking it because like, yeah, like I might be able to find some information on here that like would be helpful. Um, and so there might be a point where we go back and we look at our relationship with Twitter or whatever. We look at our relationship with singing. Um, but at least we've acknowledged our relationship with it at that point. And it, it's like uh, driven out of the realm of um, self-limiting or fear. And it's into like one of empowerment and one that we use to like our benefit um, rather than one that brings us down. So like at the, the process is, is simple, but it's complicated. It's like identifying 
what a self-limiting belief is that we have and then just starting to iterate on it like changing different things about it maybe you sing in the shower the first time and just even that would be a big deal if you've never sung before like if you haven't sung since the fourth grade like singing in the shower would be a big deal and then maybe like you sing in the car or radio like maybe like you're driving somewhere you're singing in the car like someone might see you like that's that's also a big step and then maybe it's like singing in front of your friends and like guess what like they didn't like yell at you because you your voice is a little off because all of our voices are off or maybe they tried to like bring you down a little bit but you're like but your mindset is different about it now so you're able to reckon with that better and then you sing in front of your girlfriend or your husband or significant other um and so it's just continuing to iterate um and experimenting and trying different things like those are the steps and the actions that we have to take and it's knowing that like your self-value and your worth is like not derived from like uh quote like failure or success like in these actions like these are experiments and like what do scientists do like they experiment and if something doesn't work like they go back and they analyze what didn't work about it or why didn't it work again they create like we have to create the space and time for reflection and they go, uh, and, and then they look at what they could do differently the next time. So, like, you got you're trying to sing in the shower, and you, you're not able to do it. Well, like, what, like, why, like, why can't I just sing in the shower? Like, maybe like there's a window there, and I don't know. I'm worried about someone hearing me, so I close the window. Okay, now I'm able to sing in the shower. Um, and again, it's it's like I said, it's creating that space and time for reflection. It's being non-judgmental with the experimentation and then continuing to look at like ways in which you might be able to improve and get closer to, to uh, get closer to your ideal state. Yeah, uh, that certainly that certainly sums it up. I, I think I, I like the way you phrased it because it moved for me. I'm thinking I'm thinking about these like giant things. I'm thinking about like things from trauma in the past. I'm also thinking about. I mean, real big, broad things like like even like racism, like being uncomfortable around an, uh, someone different than you, and like, but you're never around them. So then you build this fear-based belief that whatever, and you've never interacted. But like you, the way you just spoke, it brings it all the way back down to like stuff we deal with here. Um, one fear-based belief means that like you're you're afraid that your value in others' eyes will change as a result of if you took part in whatever this is. So if I sing, I'm afraid everybody's going to judge me and think I'm like terrible because I don't have that skill. Um, and then like, it, and as I say it and like one, I think we all respect the power of these fears, no matter how irrational it is, because as I say, it, that's wildly irrational. Like if I sing right now, like who cares? But irrationality is a huge thing in life. Yeah, I mean, like it's, it's like a, it's a big, like if it's a big deal to you, like it's a big deal. Like no one has the right to tell you that like, you can't discount a feeling. Yeah. Right? Like that, like it's not a big deal to you. Like we can, it could be something that you can work past, but at the moment it's a big deal to you and to like, to try to diminish that. Um, first of all, to try to diminish that in yourself is terrible, but we all do it. And so then for someone else to diminish that to you, like that's also terrible. Um, I'm not sure if we talked about it last time or not. I think we might have like the man in the arena quote, like, yep. like who, like the person that's in there with you, like, like they might have the ability to, to talk to you about it, but if they're not in there with you, like, don't give credibility to what they're saying. Yeah, and I, I've certainly seen it from the other side because as as a coach here, and in whether we're talking about nutrition or just life in general, you know, uh, I think alcohol is an easy one. And I don't mean a drinking problem. I just mean the number of people I'm like, hey, you know what you should do? Stop drinking for a month. And the number of people are like, I can't do that. Right. And they're not alcoholics. Like dead, dead. They're not alcoholics. Yeah. They don't mean I need. I'll be shaky. What they mean is like, what am I supposed to do with my friends? Right. Uh, work functions. What's my boss gonna think? Yeah. And like, I haven't had a drink in eight years, seven seven years, I think. Um, 2011, seven years, and and that's great. Woohoo! Yay! I'm 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 incredibly fortunate for that. Um, it's really not any of my like. I'm blessed to to be in this situation. But for me, I had to stop. I was not ending up in good places. So if you come to me and you're like, I don't I don't want to stop drinking because my boss might think weird. Like it would. Be, it's so easy for me to go to like. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But, and then when my younger years as a coach, it was easy for me to kind of lean that way and be like, please stop. Like, just quit drinking. That's, that's a better reason to quit drinking right there. Like, just for a month. I'm not asking you to do it forever. 
But the fact is that person, whether it's irrational or rational, that's not my business. They have a fear that if they don't have those cocktails on a Thursday night at the, the work happy hour, that they are going to be seen as less of an employee or less of a, a person in the eyes of their peers or of their, their, the authority figures in their life. And so, but for them, even like, the, the advice is still, and I'm, I'm much better about empathy there, it's still, you still got to go without it. You got to see. Because to say that you're a less of a person because you didn't have a scotch on a happy hour and the fact that you've never given yourself the chance to see. And, and then it goes even farther on a Saturday and a Sunday. We've talked about this recently um, in terms of nutrition. Our recovery is so damaging because we think that, that these these damaging behaviors are that bring value in our friends' eyes are what we have to take part in, even though we are the ones that have to go home at 3 a.m. and go, I'm being run ragged. You know, we have to be able to, I guess, identify that you want that to change, but it's not my job to judge you for whether you change or not. It's just my job to be here to, to, to help guide you if you want to make that change. But I think the greatest step would be to go without it or, and the, the vice versa, if it's something that you're not doing, I want to, to go, I want to go to a movie by myself instead of go drinking with my friends, then to go do that. Because with the singing, it's you need to sing. And with something like drinking, it's you need to not drink. It doesn't mean you're done forever. Yeah. It's so, like, on a broad scale, it's like you need to not drink, right? But, like, let's start it at simple. It's like, let's say the next time you're out with your boss, like, you don't, like, we're just working out on one instance. It's, like, you know, the next time you're out with your boss, like, you don't drink. And you see what happens. And, he, and he, if he asks you, why aren't you drinking? She asks you, why aren't you drinking? Say, like, hey, I'm just just not feeling it today. I'm just doing an experiment. And then like you go home and you see how you feel and you sit with it and you say like, Hey, like that was pretty good. I, I felt better. Like the next day my workout was better. Well, why was my workout better? Cause I didn't, I didn't drink. Like I was more mindful with my students or more, uh, more mindful with my spouse, like as a result of like not drinking. Um, and so it's just one step. Like, and we often look at these big things as if we have to do it all at once. And like you said, it's like one, it's like one iteration at a time. And like you're gonna, there might be instances in which we, which you go back and you have too many drinks with your boss, and it's being able to, like again, like acknowledge that non-judgmentally and say, like, hey, like uh, you know, I wish, I wish I had had less drinks, but this is what I did, and I'm human, and this is life, and like the next time this opportunity presents itself, like I'm just gonna do it a little bit differently next time. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. So, if chapter six is the blueprint for doing the work chapter seven is kind of like what's the bright future um kind of the look ahead where to go after you put this book down um and you and i had, had discussed we'll discuss it here i think it's easy to read and be like okay you know what's my dream what are what, are, what would i love to do but like if you really think about that and, and you and i both talked about having a hard time yeah. like Hey Adam, what makes you happy? Yeah, and and I don't mean like the, the the existential like I just I mean genuinely like if you get caught up in this world, and someone at, like what truly makes you happy, it's not crazy to be left speechless. Uh, absolutely. And I've I've still to this day I'm getting better, and we're gonna talk about it. we're gonna start with you we're gonna talk about what maybe we've done to help us begin to identify those things because to give the summary of the chapter Ruiz starts to talk about like what is your dream. Like, what is the dream you hope to live? And what, what, what might that, like, what does that look like? And I don't think he really obligates you to get too technical because I think that can tie us down of like, well, if I want that, then I've got to be able to do all these things and that can take you off focus. So just really generally, like, what is, what is the dream that, that you, I don't know, that would have you living your best life? Yeah. And I, I want to bring it back to kind of what we just said. So, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on like, like that? What do you, what brings you joy? What makes you happy? Like before you, cause if you don't know that, you don't know what the dream is. Yeah. The, and, you know, so it's, you know, I, I thought, you know, we had a, a great off air discussion about this before I'm hopping on the podcast. And a year ago when I was in a bad place, it was like my first step was to try to get back to things that made me happy. And so to add, like, you know, it was just like, I feel shitty. Like, I don't want to feel shitty. Like I'm going to try to do things that make me happy. And, we, you know, there's a whole other discussion here that, like, happiness is created within. And I think that's what everybody gets to when you go on some personal happiness Do journey. Do we want to quickly, uh, I guess we skipped it in Chapter 6, but, like, this happiness goes with that freedom thing. 
And so, like, what does it mean to be free? Because is that what he says in chapter 7? Like, what would the dream in terms of you being free and free of the agreements? And mm-hmm. so freedom, just to give kind of what he talks about, like, freedom is basically living like a child where you're only concerned with the present. Yeah. Like you're not worried. You're not resent or, or regretting the past, and you're not anxious about the future. Mm-hmm. So just to frame it for everybody, what we're talking about in terms of happiness and freedom. Okay, sorry. For sure. Go on. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, so, uh, again, like, have, you know, I think whenever we go on a personal happiness journey, we find out that happiness is created from within. But, like, yeah, obviously there are certain states and certain things uh, – you know, certain states of being and things that we like to be doing that like are responsible for happiness more than others. Um, and as I was in college basketball, like the only thing I knew was working. Like the only thing that made me happy was like winning um, or like really bad stress relief techniques like eating, drinking um, or like doing things that generally like wouldn't make me feel things. Um, and And so it was like, what makes me happy? Like, I, I didn't know, like all I'd ever done was work. And so it was like trying to sit there and be like, well, like reading kind of makes me happy. So like, l- let me go read. Um, like being at, like, I enjoy hiking. I think like CrossFit's fun. Like, let me go do that. And then you do more of that. And so this is why I'm really excited about reading better than before after the four agreements and why I've ordered it this way is because better than before, like Gretchen Rubin's, um, one of the things she does really well is she provides like, real life tips for like how to be happier in our daily lives and like draws on real life experiences for like how we can be happier in our daily lives. And so I think it's going to be a great book to read back to back because we have more of the philosophical side first and then more of the practical side second. And so one of the things that she's talked not about to mention then essentialism after that ex- minimalism or minimalizing your, the, the junk in your life. I mean, that seems like it's going to be just from what you just said on better than before. It seems like that's an even, that's a better follow up to her. Now she's going to have that. And then you're going to take that. If I cut the bullshit out, then I'm really able to be there. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, like I, you it, thought this out. It's almost like I ordered these books it's for like a you reason had a plan the whole time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so one of the things that Gretchen Rubin's talked about is like creating a list of things that you love. And so like, that's, that's like one of the things I started out doing. And here were the first, um, four things that I wrote on the list of things that I love, it was eating breakfast after an early morning workout. Like I love doing that. Like I love getting breakfast after an early morning workout. It was trying different foods. I like to try different foods. One of my friends and I, we go around in Houston and try different restaurants. Um, it was like roasted vegetables, like, like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, like asparagus. Like to me, like there's nothing better than like, I don't want to say nothing better, but like char on like a roasted vegetable is like awesome. And then crispy bacon. Like, those are the first four things that I put on there. And so it's like, if I could eat crispy bacon every day, like, yes, like, that's not the only thing that's going to be, like, uh, I'm not going to be happy just because I eat crispy bacon every day. And I don't want my happiness to be tied to eating crispy bacon. But if I could have some bacon in my morning, like, hey, I'm like, my day is better already. If I could eat breakfast after a morning workout, like, that's a great day. And so when I meet someone at 10 a.m. and they're like, how's your day going? It's going great. I got a workout in, I ate some bacon, like, you know, my, my day is going great. And so it's like being able to identify, like, um, you know, being able to identify some of those things that we love, like allows us to be happy. Cause then I think we start incorporate something, incorporating some of those things in our life more. And we start living that dream. The, the fifth item on the list is coffee and reading. And for those of you people who follow me on Instagram, like, you know, I drink a lot of coffee and I read a lot. Um, and so if I'm able to incorporate that into my day as well, again, like now, like we, I might not be doing um, living my best life or living my dream in terms of, um, you know, maybe what I'm doing at work every day or things like that. But at least like other things are turning around and I'm creating happiness in, in, like in other areas. And as we've talked about, this is all like in, this is all incremental. Like it's not going from zero to 60 right away. It's like implementing small changes to help be um to help um you know facilitate sustaining and meaningful change so it's it's i'm I'm glad you phrased it that way because we just came off of like the first step is awareness but we were using that in terms of identifying fear-based beliefs and and the agreements that maybe we did not we we're not benefiting from you need to i like the first step to admit you have a problem well, also on the positive side, the first step is to identify what is positive, identify what brings that joy. And, you know, I started 
I mean, it's we're in the end of September now. Um, about sixteen, yeah, almost a year and a half now. I started going to therapy, and I was depressed and and, and anxious, and and I was really grateful that I identified I was depressed and anxious because then I had an explanation. Before that, before I realized I was depressed and anxious, I just thought I was screwing everything up. I thought it this was just me. I was lonely and. And, and nobody else knew what I was going through. And we tend to get in that. I felt that when I was uh, struggling with alcohol as well. But when I sat down with the therapist, I actually had told him, I was like, you know, kind of the, why are you here? One of the things was like, when I asked myself, what makes you happy? I don't have a single thing to put down. Like I don't, I wouldn't write anything. I don't have anything to write down. And he goes, and like, he's not going to judge me. And I knew saying it like, of course I have things. Even in my darkest, an iced coffee still brought me joy. But I never would have thought to write that down. I never would have thought how important it would have been to what, identify. So, so that. why wouldn't you have thought to to write to identify that? Like your, the first the first session, you sit down with the therapist and and you're like nothing brings me like wh- why um you know like why why wouldn't you be able to identify something like that? Insignificance. Okay. And. And I think that's what I've probably what's impacted me the most is realizing that like one it goes kind of goes into like you shouldn't have to justify your feelings. You shouldn't have to justify something being significant because you know what? An iced coffee will always make me smile. Like you want to make me happy any time of day. You bring me a black iced coffee and like assuming it's good and it doesn't have to be great. But like if it's shit, then that's a problem. But like at least but even then even when I don't know it's crap yet. As you're walking up, I'm gonna have a smile on my face. You, Even you on hear the, that, members? On the you, if you want to make Ben happy, bring bring him a bring him a black iced coffee. I'm not gonna compare gyms, but my last two gyms brought me a lot more coffee. Um, and so, uh, but like a black iced coffee, and it, and now I recognize that that saying it's it's one of those things like it was doom and gloom, like man, today's a bad day. Well, I brought you iced coffee. Wow, it's just a coffee. I could have gotten that myself. Like yeah, I could have, but like I didn't have to because someone took the time. And I would have said thank you. I was never going to let them know that I, w- I didn't see it. But as soon as they walked away, I would, I would still drink it. But it never would cross my mind that this was a bright spot, mm-hmm. you know, um, reading. And I've told people this recently. Like, I think there are things that you do when you're happy. And for me, it's writing in my journal and reading. And it's not long. It's, even if it's just 10 minutes. But, like, when, life, when, I'm, when I'm living a healthier life, I'm generally writing and reading daily. And again, could just be 10 minutes. When I'm getting away from my center, I'm not reading and I'm not writing. I'll find myself going days without having put anything down on paper. And I'll rec- I can recognize because, you know, sometimes you don't realize how far away you're getting. Like life kind of pulls you away like incrementally until suddenly you're like really far away. I remember the, the episode of The Office. Pam's mad. The microwave's dirty. She's at the desk complaining to Jim and Jim's inching away. And she goes, are you inching away from me? And he put and, your arms out. Yeah. And she, he goes, no, I've always been this close. And she goes, put your arms out. And he can't reach the desk. And I'm like, I feel like that's life. I feel like when it's not egregious, when it's not this giant act, these little things, little gossip, little thoughts, they pull you away from where you were. And so um, it's, it's something where once I, I can see read, I'm like, man, I haven't read in a while. Uh oh. Like, that's not just about I'm not reading. That's more like, have I been sleeping well now? How's my diet? Have I been kind to my, my clients? Have I been kind to my coaches? Like, how far reaching is this? And so I'm able to recognize that. But reading brings me joy. Writing brings me joy. And, and coffee brings me joy. And those are three things that brought me joy even in my darkest days. They were the bright spots because that's the tools I used. If things were real bad and I needed to get away from everybody, I was going to go to a coffee shop that nobody knew me and I was going to take a book and take a journal. And that was it. And, and in that moment, I still wouldn't identify it as being happy. And so I think it's probably an agreement I made. It's probably an agreement that I'm not worth being happy. And so even when there's something obvious that brings me joy – I'm not allowed to admit it brings me joy because that's weak of me to celebrate positivity. That's weak of me to celebrate like dreaming, you know? Um, and I think that's why for all the, 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 the thoughts we've had recently, like I know exactly why when I got sober, I immediately adopted a fascination of Walt Disney world. It is because 
from the age of like five to 13, my family took me to Disney World every year because my dad had a convention there. So we got to go for free. Okay. So we got to go every year. And from five to 13, I hadn't screwed anything up yet. I was a good kid. Went to church, behaved myself. Teachers were proud of me, all the, other than my music teacher, obviously. <laughs> all right? Um, like, life was good. Well, you know what? After 13, I got to have a little bit more control, you know? And I got, like, things like pressure in sports. I was a really good athlete, specifically in soccer. And so suddenly it wasn't about having fun. Suddenly it was, like, making the right team. And then I made the right team, and it wasn't good enough. Now it was about winning the right tournament and performing at the biggest stage and you're going to go to North Carolina and there's going to be 70 D1 coaches circling the field and you've got to perform. It's not fun anymore. And then, Oh, you didn't play that well. Not, like everything changed. And then you get to the to college and there's prioritizing partying and prioritizing drinking and missing opportunities because you thought that it was more important to be here. So life got crazy, you know, um, confronting adulthood, just even without making big mistakes. And so as soon as I get sober, I'm going, when was life good? When was I like unadulterated joy? Wait, unadulterated, unadult joy? When was I a kid? Well, last time I was a kid was when I was a kid. What was my favorite thing when I was a kid? Disney World. Okay, so that's what I would start dreaming about, yeah. you know? And, and Ruiz talks about that as well, right? He talks about the kid playing in the sandbox and the joy that we have when we're, when we're kids. And so if, if this is striking a chord with anybody and they're like – they're in the same place, a similar place that, that we both were, where what brings you joy? Uh, I don't know. Like think about those things when, when you, when you were kids that like that brought you joy, that's a great place to start. And it sounds like that's kind of where you started uh, with, with all of this. Cause there has to be something. There has to be something that makes you, that at least makes you smirk. There has to be something. And I think that what you brought up making a list, no matter how thin you think that list is going to be, I think I, it's, it's the awareness, identifying it, putting it down, uh, Ruiz talks about repetition. Um, and when I was reading the repetition, and I, I forget how he said it, but like it brought up affirmations. You know what everybody should do right now? They should pause this podcast, look in the mirror, and say, you are fucking awesome. And say it to yourself. Because you know what? No matter where you're at, you feel better. Like, you feel better. Absolutely. There's something there. Like, and I don't mean kind of better. Like, you get this warm, fuzzy feeling across your body because you know you are fucking awesome. But life prevents you from believing that outside of that mirror. And honestly, some of you would have a hard time. Like some of you right now, like would not be able to do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I was there. Like, and that's not something I do every day. And I should. Okay. I know someone that went to like this intensive therapy thing. They had to go to Arizona and they stayed there for like seven days. Um, it's called the Meadows. And like, it's this crazy, awesome, powerful experience. But the most powerful day and like this, her telling the story made me cry. You sit in a room. You're sitting in front of a row of people, you're, and you're in these small groups for the seven days, like six people. So you're in front of five people staring at you, and like, <laughs> you have to go across, and they basically have to tell you, look you and I say, you are beautiful, and you are amazing, and you are smart. Each person says a different thing. After five of those, you're in tears, especially when you're in your darkest place. Well, the thing about uh, what Ruiz talks about towards the end of the book, when he, when he talks about expressing our love and being able to tell people that, that like, I love you, that, like, I love you, you know, uh, and a way that this book like really manifested change in myself is like every time I talk to a family member, like I tell them that I love them. Uh, if it's a, a call with my brother and, you know, it, I started going to see my brother more. He lived in Philly when I was up in Ithaca. Um, and it, you know, it, it realized that like this love that we have to give to others, like people need to hear that. Like we need to share that. Like that needs to be a part of our lives more. Um, and, you know, like we're we're worried because of like what somebody gonna think when I tell them that like oh they they know I love them I don't need to tell them but like a it's gonna make you feel better b you're gonna make that person's day like I tell my parents every time like I love you I tell my brother every time like I love you like my uncle has cancer like uh I like I haven't seen him in a very long time like I even if I'm leaving a message on his phone like I tell him that I love him um I tell my friends that, like that I love them. Like, uh, if there's one thing that I've realized in, in the past, you know, you, when you when you go through personal crisis and change, like you find out who's really supporting you and, and who's not, right? But like the the ones that are really supporting you, like that that's love. And if like you can't express that and like be grateful for that, then like um, like I think that needs to change. And so like you know, a great way to express gratitude for that is just say like, hey, like I love you, I really do. Like 
look him in the eye and like mean it. And like, there's something wrong with that. Like something wrong with expressing that significance to someone else. And I think that, and, and I know Ruiz talks about this. Like, I, I think there's something to it. It's maybe it sounds silly, but I think part of our purpose is to give love to others. And so I Absolutely. think that I, one, as someone that feels as though, and this is mom, if you're listening, you told me you love me a lot. This is not what I'm referring to. But for a very long period of my life, I did not feel love. Um, the people that I would date, interact with, they did not care to tell me they love me, even if we had crossed that momentous thresh- threshold of admitting we love each other or whatever. Like, I always end up in these situations. And maybe it's because I didn't think I deserve love, so why on earth should they be responsible for giving me love if I'm going to act like I don't deserve love? But, like, I was never really told that, that I was loved. And, um, you know, and there's other things. We can get real. I'm adopted and uh, abandonment, you know, still haunts me and all that stuff. And my birth mother's amazing. She did not abandon me. Like, she did what was best for me. And, and, and I, was, I was loved to death by my parents. But, like, it's still there. So, like, for me, I'm wired kind of to feel unloved so i know that i can speak to the power of people saying like telling people you love them as the receiver it is incredibly moving like to the point of discomfort but like it is incredibly moving but as the giver as well there's something that you feel when it's genuine like if you're like yeah i'm the positive person like fake positivity of like you're awesome that's not that's not it if you get off on that that's fine but like if it's genuine and nobody's to judge if it's genuine or not if it's genuine you will receive as much as the person you're giving to i think because again life's about energy man like it goes back to being impeccable with your word if it's the fake energy you're not impeccable and you're not gonna like feel that energy that you're that you're talking when you know someone that's like a man or woman like they don't mince work they don't waste breath and they take some of that valuable breath to say something important about you you're awesome you're impactful i love you that that hits you like when someone you know doesn't bullshit Mm -hmm. comes up and is like hey man what you're doing is awesome whoa and i appreciate when anybody says it but like there are people that you know that you look up to because you know they don't go around just throwing stuff around they only speak to the heart and they say it man because they're they're impeccable with their word and so that's so incredibly impactful. And so as we become more impactful with our word, as we work on that, we, I think we have a duty, but I don't think it has to be seen as a duty, as like a task, an obligation. I think we have an opportunity to share our love for other people. Yeah, it's a, it's a practice, right? Like I, I've used that word in our discussions a lot. Like this stuff is all a, a practice. When we're practicing something, like we're just trying to get better at it. And there's going to be times where we mess up or times where we're not as good as other times. But, like, it's all, it's, we're like, it's all just a practice. I've, I talked about in the last podcast, like, the infinite game, like, the like the long, slow trajectory, like, along a distant horizon. Like, that's all this is. Like, we're not, like, we're not in it to, like, win or lose. Like, we're, like, we are practicing. Like, we're trying to get better. Like, we're trying to live better lives. And, like, you don't do that by, like, checking a, a, something, like, off a list. Um. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I don't think there's much else to be said for that. So I mean, kind of with the end of chapter seven, um, the quote that I took out of there, and I don't think it's at the very. It's somewhere towards the end. Chapter seven's not super long. Um, happiness is a choice. So is suffering. And I don't want to say that sums up the book, but for me personally, I think that was my biggest takeaway. And of course, it, it the the whole point of the book was that acknowledging the agreements we've made both positive and negative acknowledging the conscious agreements as well as acknowledging that there are many unconscious or subconscious agreements that we've made over time um implemented by others in our own lives uh whether it's you know teachers and parents as we grew up or adopted by ourselves knowingly and unknowingly and so everything like in terms of the it's a choice to be happy and it's a choice to to be a victim choice to be to suffer that's a simplified statement and that is not to say that I get to bounce up tomorrow, and when I'm having a bad day, I should be like, well, damn it, Ruiz says it's just a choice, so obviously I'm screwing this up. But it sh- I think it should be seen, even in, its simpli- in, s- in its simplicity, I think it should be seen as an opportunity. It doesn't mean we're going to be great at it right away, because as what you just said, it's a practice. But uh, I think that's probably my, it might be my takeaway from the book, um, but it's certainly my takeaway from chapter seven, um, is that, that the happiness is a choice, and so is suffering. And, and so when I'm down... I'm making the choice to be down. And again, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm weak for making that choice. It just means I can acknowledge I can work my way out of it. I don't have to be in that, that headspace. Yeah. Uh, it's, 
it, it's funny. I, I've been reading some and listening to more on like Buddhism and meditation and mindfulness um, lately. Um, and I came across something about the Four Noble Truths yesterday. Yeah. And it's funny that there's the Four Noble Truths and the Four Agreements. They both have to deal with happiness and suffering. Four Noble Truths, the first one is said, says that life is suffering, that grasping is the cause of suffering. So like holding on to expectations and holding on to judgments and, and trying to not acknowledge that life is suffering, like is suffering. When, and when you know, Buddhists talk about life is suffering, they don't mean that like we're always in physical pain. They, they just mean that like life is constantly changing. And then the third one is that we can stop suffering, that, uh, you know, that like I said, that we can stop suffering. And the fourth one is the eightfold path in the Buddhist way to um, get out of suffering. But it's the same, it's the same thing as the four agreements. Like we have that choice. Like that's what it basically says that like you have to acknowledge the situation. Like life is su suffering. Grasping is the cause of suffering. Like stop grasping. Then your suffering uh, will end along the eightfold path. And the same thing here. Like, you know, you, if you realize that like happiness, that you're in charge of your happiness, like happiness comes from within like then then you're going to be happier and so i'm glad that that's one of your takeaways from the book um because like yeah it's like it like it is so powerful as we move through as we move through this practice is that like it comes from within and there's going to be times where someone is going to do something to piss you off it might happen today and it's just being able to like sit with it and then get back to that place of happiness like more quickly and be like okay like all right what did i do here i i took it personally all right like don't want it to happen again like now i'm back to now i'm back to where i need to be yeah i think that's very well said so four agreements first book of the black wolf book club i want to say that i think one as you touched on at the beginning of this i think the engagement from the 30 athletes that chose to take this on was pretty great yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Like could've, I've been blown away by it. Could have been be an easy one you. where everybody signs up and nobody follows through, and it, it really seems like people took advantage of this opportunity. But I, I want to say that before I kind of give you the chance to, to to wrap up this book and your thoughts on how it went, I think that these study guides were incredibly valuable. Um, and if there's any athletes or anybody that did not take advantage of them, I think you should go back through it and just even if you don't want to reread the book, even though you can do that very quickly. I think that there's so much power, especially in this chapter six one. I think you could take this chapter six one without the book and it gives you those reflection points that we probably, and maybe that's one of the things like society never asks you to investigate these things. Society's never like, Hey, why aren't you free? Society's never like, Hey, what makes you happy? You know, it doesn't. Society tells you what makes you happy. Hey, watch this. It makes you happy. Go here. It makes you happy. Buy this. It makes you happy. And I don't want to get into like this material debate, but like, Maybe for a second we take this and, and if you, and, and I, for me, if I'm not, if meditation is daunting to me, then I think something like this, um, is I could sit down with this in the mornings before work starts. I could sit down midday when I have a break and this is like a good jumping off point. Take, you know, piece of paper, write on this piece of paper and just kind of doodle your thoughts about these questions and see where it leads. And so. I think this chapter six study guide is awesome, but I think you did really well with all of them. I want to thank you for, for putting them all together because I think it made my reading of the text a lot. It, it's a little bit guided, but it's still offered for the freedom to, to interpret. You weren't telling us how to think about something, but you were kind of letting us know like, hey, it's like uh, when you went to your L1 and they like wrote on the board in red. They're like, all right, we're, we're going to write in black marker. But if it's in red or if I write it in capital letters, maybe pay attention yeah. to this. Well, the other part about going to the L1, when you said when you went to your L1, what popped into my mind is when, like, they're asking you to correct someone's movement. And they're like, what do you see? And you're like, uh, I don't know. And they're like, well, look at his knee. Like, maybe that's what I think I was trying to do here more was uh, trying to, like, if our vision is pointing one way, like, I'm trying to say, well, let's look over there, too. Um, so, uh yeah, just trying to, like, guide the learning a little bit. Well, because once I – okay, so they say look at his knee. They don't tell you why to look at his knee. Once I start looking at his knee and see what they're talking about, it doesn't mean I won't see his hip as well. Yep. It actually puts me in the right mindset to then see the hip. Mm -hmm. So, sure, they gave me a specific place, and you gave us a specific place to start. Yeah. And well, then we're able to go from there. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Ben. Uh, obviously, like, you've been a huge impetus for getting this thing kick-started as well. Um, you know, again, the goal here was just to provide – 
like some guys to help like widen that that vision, that perspective, that lens that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. And, and like I hope it did that um, for you guys. It sounds like it did it for you, Ben. And, and like that makes like th- that makes me feel great. Like one of the lists of things that I love is like like talking about thoughts with others and like I'm um, really like doing meaningful work in which like uh, others are allowed to change their lives as a result. And like, I want to make it clear, like this is like the work, like you guys do the work. Like I don't do the work. Like, um, like all I do is say like, Hey, look over there. Like the work begins with you. And like, it starts with reflection. Like we all have the power like within ourselves to change uh, our circumstances or whatever, like however we're currently unhappy. Like we all have the power um like you can make that decision today like like and and that work is really important the most the most meaningful work that we do like is on ourselves it's how we make the greatest impact in the world in in the world but that doesn't happen uh just by chance that doesn't happen because we want it to like it happens with like serious reflection like and it is going to be painful like keep on putting in the work like keep on sitting with those emotions like uh like you might like it might be discomfort like that's okay like sit with the discomfort and then like love yourself, tell yourself that you're awesome, like find a way to give back to yourself and then like put in the work again the next day. I think, uh, well said. Okay. So I think I wanted to ask for each book that we read. Um, and this will be, that's my final question. Kind of rereadables. There are some books that you should reread and I don't mean right away. I mean like revisit yearly, you know, maybe when you feel called to, um, for me, I think this is a book that I, I should revisit at least once a year. And, I mean, that's arbitrary. I don't care what you come up with. But, like, you know, another book might not be. The next book, it might be amazing, but it's, it's too dense or something. Mm-hmm. So on this one, like, do you think there's a value in, in ha- like, keeping this book with you and making sure you don't lose it? Don't don't throw it away. Pass it on. I mean, I guess pass on's value. You could always buy it again. But do you think this is a rereadable book? Uh, I, I absolutely do think it's a rereadable book. Like, I have reread it multiple times since I first read it, um, you know, in uh, January, February of this past year. And, like, not just for the book club to prepare the reading guides. Um, it's absolutely, um, like, rereadable. Uh, to me, the, the books are that are rereadable are the ones that are timeless, right, that we can draw on again and again and again. And to me, things that are timeless, like, help create – like sustainable and meaningful change like we've been talking about and they help bring us back to center um so like this book like helps me like reorient like towards my values like the questions um that are in it like it's it's non it's specific without being specific so like we interpret the specificity of it um but it again it points us in those directions of where we need to look and for me like this book helps me reorient myself towards my values and so if I get straight or things in my life change, like right, like life is constant change, like I can go back to this book or at least some of the questions in it to help get me back to where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, I think I think we'll for the for going forward we'll come up with like a, a measuring system because it'll be like the value you get upon rereading versus the amount of effort required to reread. And and it's gonna kind of be balance out there that, that's re- yeah. some value with a thousand pages, but man, it took a lot of work to read the thousand that, that's pages. That's the other thing is like I think as you guys have discovered, like this book is a fairly quick read. Um, the times that I've reread it, the amount of time that I've spent rereading it has like gone down each time. And so like, it, like the, the power of this, like is in part, like how quickly you, like you can take like one afternoon and reread it. And like your life will instantly uh, um, avoid, I'm going to avoid making a claim here, but uh, I would argue that, um, your your life could be potentially much better, like just within an afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I abs- I and I think you could you could even flip it open and just like land on a page and go, and and you're gonna draw. If you got five minutes, throw it down and see where it lands and read, and it's gonna have something that that gives you the opportunity to make a change in that moment and, and to better your day, better your life. Okay, well, as I said, um, this book is wrapping up this Sunday with a potluck. Roundtable discussion, September 30th from 12.30 to 2. Discussion begins at 12.30. Please arrive before then. Okay. And then on October 2nd, that is two days later, we're kicking off uh, book number two, Better Than Before by Gretchen Rubin. We will have copies available here, or, of course, you can grab your own. Uh, Our copies will be delivered on Monday, and so um, that's when you'll be able to pick them up if you're going to grab them from us. I will send emails out. Um, to the masses if you want to get signed up 
for book number two. All right, well, that's all I got, Adam. Thank you again. I think this was a great first. I mean, I don't think it could have gone better. Um, it's kind of crazy for CrossFit Gym to have a book club and for us to have one in it, and we actually followed through. Uh, there was discussions every time. People discussed with us, came up individually and talked to us. I don't know how this could have been better, man. I think uh, I think both because of the work you put in and then the athletes actually participating. Because, of course, it's, we're nothing without that. Yeah, and, it, you know, it goes back to the athletes, like you said. Um, you know, I'm sure it could have been better, and we'd love to hear your feedback on it the ways that, that it could. Um, again, like like I said, like you guys are putting in the work. Like the most meaningful work that we do is, this, is the work that we put in on ourselves. And, like, thank you for being so, you know, willing – um, and able to take on this challenge like no change takes place like without commitment from like ourselves so you know the 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 thanks is to the athletes and people who are putting in the work absolutely all right well that does it for us looks like we went just over an hour so i hope you enjoyed the episode let us know what you think in the comments send us emails whatever you want to do we love to chat look for that survey in your email because if you're listening to this it is already there have a fabulous day